Hello, everyone. It is the Death Chicks. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm Patty Burgess, and uh, I am one of the Death Chicks. I'm with DoingDeathDifferently.com and Teaching Transition. Teaching, tra I can't even speak today. We were laughing so much. My my muscles aren't used to this. <laughs> TeachingTransitions.com, and uh, I have with me our my wonderful co-host, and that's Misty Lynn of BittersweetBlessing. Dot com and uh, we're gonna have a great show today you know this is our um, our grief series and really what we are is a forum for death dying grief and loss and especially now towards the end of the year as we begin sort of a holiday season uh, and, and I think we can talk about grief at any time but uh, at this particular time I think it's really up a little bit more for for uh, many of us so we've got a great guest with us today Jane Duncan Rogers and I'm going to pass it on over to Misty who is going to introduce her so take it away Misty Hi everyone, and uh, we were laughing pre-show because I reminded Jane of the time that we were um, at a business conference together. It was, I think, 2014, and uh, Jane and I had dined together. At the time, Jane was still grieving the, the loss of her husband, and afterwards, someone came to me and, and said, uh, Misty, um, Jane's passed out and, and she, she needed medical attention what did what did you feed her so <laughs> it was all right I don't think it had to do with the food but um so so we go back a ways and the wonderful wonderful thing is that um when I met Jane she was kind of sitting she was a business coach and she was sitting on the fence um uh, about kind of moving into this this scary death industry and uh but she she was such a rich wealth of of that person and of there's a lot of depth Jane she's wonderful so I was encouraging her and it's uh, wonderful to see the release of her book um, uh, gifted by grief it's a brilliant book uh, even if you're not grieving there's a lot of insight in there wonderful read and and now she's gone on to create a program called before I go um, when her husband was diagnosed with cancer uh, she had to go through the steps of of figuring out you know what what do we need to take care of and she was quite cognizant of that as was her husband and and now she's helping others do that um, recently Jane has uh, created a nonprofit society called before I go solutions so that's in process so she can help um, others in a bigger way and lastly something I'm very excited about and I can't wait to, to show and share people this and Jane has a, a lovely drawing is Ellie Jane has birthed a mascot. She thought uh, she's tired of doing this alone. Maybe I don't know why, but some of the times these things come to pass. And and this is Ellie. Ellie is the end of life elephant in the room. And and Jane, maybe maybe we can start with Ellie. Can can you show sure. a picture? Sure, sure. Oh, and I just gonna put Jane's website, giftedbygrief.com, uh, or if you Google that, it'll be something very similar. Thank you so much, Miss Dean Patty. Um, Yes, I was talking, you know, death for many people is the elephant in the room, one of the biggest elephants in the room, actually. But, you know, I've always been known for talking about elephants in the room, no matter what they are. You know, if there's an elephant in the room, I'll point it out. <laughs> so it can, it's not always necessarily comfortable being around me. But anyway, um, when I thought about this elephant in the room, the image that came to mind was end of life Ellie. That was the words just came and then... I had an image of this elephant and then so I had to just get out my coloring pencils and draw her and here she is. Oh look how beautiful. Oh, like see, there you go. So she's got little pink toes. I think I started with the pink toes. <laughs> and she's got a little um thing around her neck saying end of life Ellie and you know I love doodles on my um, business coaching site um, wildwisdom.co.uk it's all about doodles at that time in my life being creative was really really important um, to bring into my work and um, so it's natural for me you know whenever I'm listening to anything I'm doodling whether it's in black and white or color so this was a normal thing to do to coat Ellie in these um, colors so this only happened like a few days ago I don't know exactly how she is going to the part that she's going to play in this work but I do know that she's um, an introduction to a subject that people find difficult to talk about and the fact is she 
lives in the room of everybody in everybody's house and she's really sad for the most part because most people ignore her and pretend that she doesn't exist but actually when you have a conversation with her which is what I facilitate then you discover that she and the subject of death and end of life matters and grief and all of this stuff that you guys talk about can be illuminating informative loving and you can even enjoy it so that's her role in in bringing that into the room <laughs> wonderfully said jane wonderfully said and it kind of i'm reminded of my um my brand bittersweet blessing which me is is really about when you address those nasties when you address the bitter when you're willing to instead of turn away and uh, when you're willing to face it uh, straight on and say, okay, let's have a look at it. It's it's really not that bad. And, and there's so many gems inside there that um, yeah. that's part of the human sp experience and, and that uh, it, it, that call to us, that call to us, like yeah. the elephant in the room. They're always there and it's, it's time that we start to open up and look at them. Yes. And you know, I... I want to add to something that Misty shared earlier before the show, um, and I, as you were talking about it this time, I just got this image. Uh, yes, she is sad because nobody's talking about her, but I also notice, just like when we got here and we started to create a tribe, that the more you talk about her, the more she colors in and gets more colorful. Yeah. So I could just see this like animation when you know, people start talking about her, all this color begins to uh, come yeah. on to her. And, uh, and as Misty said, she could be, you know, once you complete whatever it is you need to do, she could be, you know, you can color in those next pieces. And she oh. seems very, very timely with all these beautiful coloring uh, yeah. books out here now. I love that. That is a here. lovely yeah. idea. So uh, I can just see her getting it? colorful. <laughs> yeah, me too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can imagine her in a, maybe a palliative care ward in a hospital or in a hospice mm -hmm. and, and just on the wall. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and the patients can go and, and do some wall art. And, yes. and, uh, yeah. Yeah. There, there's so many potentials. It's a, it's a brilliant image and, and something that needs to be talked about. So, woohoo! Sure. Way to go to giving birth to end of life, Ellie. She's <laughs> yeah. with us now. And, and what, a big, what a big birth she was, too, as an elephant. <laughs> Oh, no. oh, that's great. Well, you know, so we speaking, didn't, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to take we go. us back. I was going to say, speaking of big things, um, I know there's um, some big things been going on in the world that we haven't really addressed yet. But it, it I think it could. It, I think it's connected to grief. I've, I've talked to some people who are sad with the the recent um, US election and, and Brexit is, is still relatively recent. Jane, um, I'm from Canada and you're from the UK. Um, would you care to touch on how grief affects us when it may not be a death of a person? Mm. Yes, I uh, was very aware of this with initially Brexit um, and because it felt like it well it was the death of something it was the death of an institution the death of a way of life the death of a way of thinking or i should say it is because it's still going on um and um and um similar as well with the usa election um but it can be any it can be any big event actually i don't think that we as a society um we underestimate what effect this sort of thing has on us we yeah. don't understand that actually these are events of loss not necessarily for everybody but every change brings a loss of a kind so if we're talking about loss regardless of what your beliefs are then there are we can look to the important things about how we deal with grief to help us make that transition from a place of loss into a place of um, a more balanced way of, of viewing life. So happened, I wrote a blog and then just after the USA election, I wrote another blog um, and I think, what, let me just see what I entitled it here. Um, yeah, three non-actions to take in the wake of Donald Trump being elected and anxiety being uppermost. Now, of course, not everybody had anxiety about Donald Trump being elected, but 
A lot of people did, a lot of people didn't. Either way, we're dealing with a loss here. And in that blog, I talk about non-actions. Non-actions, if we think about it in relationship to somebody dying, then usually it's a close person to us if we're you know badly affected by it and non-action actually is one of the things that just happens anyway you find that you can't think straight it's difficult to make decisions you don't know what it is that you want to do you can't remember what day it is um all sorts of symptoms like this those are normal symptoms of grief now you might not be feeling those and attributing them directly to um a, a big event like um the uh, like in politics but you can um, pay attention to what is going on in in such a way that it can help you transition through this time more easily so those three non-actions and you can see them on my blog at giftedbygrief.com they are one is watch out for statements that you make that keep you separate for others and that's I mean, we all know this. We say or think things that keep us right and another person wrong. Those are things that are designed to keep us separate. And actually, what is needed to be done is that we pause and we just breathe and we go underneath and discover uh, what more there is there for us. And it's very easy when you're grieving that, you know, somebody dying, it's easy to feel like I'm the only one in the world that this has happened to. I can remember thinking that, you know, I knew perfectly well that husbands and wives die every day. So I knew there were other people out there, logically, I knew this, going through similar stuff to me, but it felt like I was the only one in the world. And that sometimes led to me thinking, um, uh, being kind of maybe a little bit blameful in my thoughts or, or, or justifying negative things that I was thinking, you know, it wasn't helpful. This is what I've learned, so I can now say that actually this is not helpful. Um, the other point that I made there it is, yeah, it's about, I say, it's a little bit of a mouthful what I've written here, withstand the emotion-based demands from your mind, which likes to control and feel certain. When there's a death of anything or a major change in life, um, in whatever way that is, then our minds are, are, are completely geared to our survival. And that they, what they like is certainty and thinking that they know what is gonna happen. So when something happens, which it disturbs everything, we seek around for something that we can cling hold of. And understandably, it's like we want a, a, a in a stormy sea, we want a life raft. Um, but those, the way that we're thinking at that time is often based on fear. And if you then act out of that fear, it's often not helpful. And that's one of the reasons that people talk about um, that common thing where, you know, people are told not to make major decisions a year after the death of someone close to them. Well, that's one of the reasons why, because the, the actions that are taken are often those based, they're coming from a not a very balanced place. And the third one, well, it's kind of associated, it's being willing to experience the sea of uncertainty and unknowing. And that is uh, easier that's, said than done. <laughs> I think that's um, one of the, the biggest ones because all of us are creatures of, I think we're exactly. heat and comfort seeking missiles, yeah. you know, and when, when something is upset to say, let me sit in this, when, exactly. when, let me sit in this, but there's a learning there. Tell us about yeah, well, I, I mean, I knew this in theory, and but I learned it for myself personally when uh, after Philip died. And now this is nearly five years ago. Um, uh, but at least for that first year, when I was feeling things in such a raw way, whatever it was, um, I began to understand. Well, I knew one thing, which was I needed to just feel whatever it was that was being felt, because actually that was going to be the quickest way that I would get through it. I knew that from my um, my training as a psychotherapist, and I knew that from my reading as you know, being fascinated in the personal development and spiritual world for years. But it was jolly uncomfortable because these are these were not pleasant feelings. You know, there were, for me there was a lot of anger and a lot of tears, 
there wasn't so much fear, but I know other people who get into it really, really very scared. They can hardly go out the front door, if at all, actually. Um, but I knew that it was important to just be with those. And that's how I discovered that if an emotion comes knocking on your front door, even though intuitively, if you don't want the emotion that is, even though intuitively you want to shut the door and pull down the blinds and close the curtains, actually what you need to do is open the windows and open the door and open the back door of the house at the same time so that the emotion can come in and then it can leave really easily. And that's exactly what happens because emotions hang around to make their presence felt when we resist them. It's not that we don't feel them. We do feel them, but we, but we resist them. And so they make their presence felt in different ways, which can be anything from um, working too hard or um, exercising too much or addictions of all sorts of kinds, all sorts, all sorts. I'm sure you know this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, my goodness, that's so true. And, and I love the analogy of, of opening the door, front door, but also opening the back door. And it's so true. As soon as we turn to face them, and this is a lot of the work that I do with, with women, is uh, as soon as we have the courage to, to look at them and, and feel them in their f fullness, they leave. And it, we can spend years, we can spend our whole lives resisting and ignoring. But as soon as we start the practice, and it takes practice, and it's a bit of a process. But once you start doing it, you'll realize something really big, as soon as you look at it and sit with it. Sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's a half an hour, bigger stuff can maybe be a few. But it's relatively quick that these yeah. things move on. And, and you're back to ground zero, you're back to yeah. good you know, stable, feeling good on with the day. Here we go. So, yeah. So well said. Yeah. yeah. yeah and I think just another a little point on that though, because when an emotion that we like comes knocking at the door, and they come as well, what we try and do is, well, we open up the doors, of course, but we try and get that emotion in, and then we want to keep it there. So we shut everything. We try really hard to keep it there. And of course it doesn't work because it leaches out anyway because the whole point about this, about emotions of any kind is that they are supposed to come and they're supposed to go. And the more that we can go with that, the easier life we actually have. Um, because they don't, um, it, th that's us then trusting in the process of life itself. Yeah, just wanted to point that out. <laughs> sure, so, and some people would liken that to Two different things that came to mind was um, as you hear some martial artists who say they kind of transmute the energy coming from them and use that energy to whether it's to flip or to change or whatever but what I also understand about martial artists is that they're in a balanced place an understanding place about not holding on not grasping not suffering but sort of transmuting and yeah. um, that's that's I think something that can come from grief you know when you talk about gifted by grief or yeah. the gifts of grief that to me seems like a gift and then you know the other the other things that uh, I've seen this since I've raised a duck <laughs> and been now watching ducks um, <laughs> and when I'm out there kind of like you can see a dust up a, a squabble happen we went to visit uh, we, we rescued another duck we didn't take him home it was Chuck the duck um, we took him to this um, sanctuary but uh, we noticed that there was a couple of ducks over here that were fighting and then they would shake it off, like actually literally shake, like to get rid mm -hmm. of that, um, the cortisol level. Mm -hmm. And then off they'd go and you'd see them come back together again and then they were sleeping on the bank right next to each other. And I thought, wow, there's a lesson for me. I always get my lessons from animals who, um, you know, if it's a panther, it may eat you, but there's <laughs> no, no hard feelings. I was going down that road but <laughs> and I love I love the animals especially cats <laughs> I, love, I love the metaphor like of shaking it off yes it's shaking it off which we don't do we hold all that in and then we wonder why those cortisol levels are blood pressure levels mm -hmm. all of that kind of thing and it's so hard to remember when you're in the midst of it and I don't know about you, but have you ever noticed that, um, you, that, that there's a kind of tension in your body? I mean, part of it is like human tension that your muscles have to all kind of come together so that you can stay together and not be one oozing 
you know, like pot of, of goo or anything, but there's a, there's a place that tension is too much. Like there's been times where I felt like, my God, I didn't even know I was that stressed because that's how I've been holding myself all the time. I yeah. think that's because I haven't opened that door, that metaphoric door that you've been talking about as, as, as much and maybe a metaphoric back door mm -hmm. um, to let it go because it settles in and movement helps, I know, which I could yeah. use more of. Yeah, there's lots of things that help to, to do that. And it's interesting you're talking about the ducks there because, you know, actually small children, if you watch small children, they know how to do this too, generally speaking. Um, if they will, they will be quite um, upfront about how they feel towards a kid. And yeah. that's why, you know, children say, oh, you're my friend. And then half an hour later there, you're not my friend anymore, you know, because they're growing <laughs> up and down with the, with the waves, if you like, of emotion, but nothing is hanging around. And we can learn a lot from, well, from ducks and children. And it's true. Yeah. I do. I do wish I could sometimes do that on my Facebook feed, but it, it would look like a schizophrenic mess. You're my friend. <laughs> you are not my friend. You're my friend. You're not my friend. But anyway, no, that's a good point. That is a good point. It's just very out there with raw emotion. Yeah. Jane, I'm wondering, talking about raw emotion, when there's people who are dealing with with grieving or or pre grieving when they when they know a loss is imminent um and there is that elephant in the room and there's mm -hmm. such it feels like a big fat huge elephant like it mm -hmm. can be so heavy mm -hmm. and how how do you bridge that like how can you like what's the best way to broach the subject and to open it up and and do, do allow you mean people to feel comfortable uh, do you mean that when some when it appears in the family, say, as if somebody is dying, but nobody's actually talking about it? Is that what you mean? It could be that, yeah, mm -hmm. and it, it could be. It, it's I was speaking generally, but but answer that one. Just when okay. that elephant is so big, you yeah. know, so big, and you know it's there, and you 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 said you're very good at just putting it on the mm -hmm. table. So share with us okay. how. Okay, well, here's a little story. Um, after about three months after my husband died, his granddaughter, my step granddaughter, age 16, also died of cancer. And, you know, 16 years old. It was tragic, absolutely tragic. She had uh, two brothers and a sister younger than her. And the following year, no, it wasn't the following year. When was it? Gosh, I can't get the time right. But anyway, some months later, I think it was. I met up with that family and we we all met in a, a holiday place that we had used to go to all together, all the families. And we met up because this was where my husband wanted his ashes to be scattered on the beach down there. And this was the first time that I'd seen the family since their, their daughter and their um, sister had died. So it, it, it was, um, it was lovely to see them, but it was very poignant as well. And, you know, there were tears occasionally. And um, we did have the ceremony of, of scattering some of uh, the ashes of both of them. And then the next day, I, I didn't know how to talk to the nine-year-old the, the nine daughter. I wanted to say something. We were out on a walk together. And I wanted to somehow acknowledge the fact that her sister had died. It's a huge thing, you know. Um, and I said, um, what do you think happens when somebody dies, Sita? And she was amazing. She was skipping along the rocks at the time. And she said, oh, she said, that's easy. And they go up to heaven and it's like a floating garden. And they're all living in a hotel together. And Becky's there and Grandpa Philip is there and Michael Jackson and everybody from the Titanic. <laughs> and this was amazing. And the thing, so we were able to talk about that just a little bit. You know, we were, it was kind of like, it wasn't directly about her sister, and yet it was. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I was able to share that with the parents as well. And that allowed us to talk about it more freely, you know. So, but the question that I asked was a question that came at it from a sort of sideways angle rather than head on. And I think that sometimes that's what needs to be done. Um, in this case, you know, 
when I asked that question, I was met with this just delightful answer, which I could never have imagined she might have said. But in, the lo in her logical mind at nine years old, that was how she was explaining it. Um, but um, there are other questions that you can share with people about, uh, let me just think, I've got a little list of it here. You know, some, you can refer to um, maybe a recent death, perhaps of a celebrity or perhaps of somebody in the family. You can some, say something like, you know, I was thinking about when Uncle Joe died and it actually it made me realise. And then you say whatever it is that it made you realise. And, and you might ask another person, the person that you're with, a direct question. You might say, how did it affect you? You know, how do you feel about it? So it's not that you're asking them directly about them, <coughs> themselves, but you're introducing the topic, if you like. Um, because I think it's when we, well, it's when we all know that there is an elephant there, but nobody <laughs> dares say it, that it actually mm -hmm. begins to become, uh, it's not really toxic, but it's uncomfortable and people don't necessarily know why okay. it's uncomfortable. So it takes someone who's, who recognizes what's going on to have the courage to do that. That's yeah, great. yeah. That's great Simple questions. How did it affect you? That's nice. Or how do you mm. feel about it? And and yeah. often, you know, it's it's very close and close to their heart and in their mind. So that as an opener is like, oh, you know, it allows them to release and to speak to it. And if you yeah, know, if they're I, comfortable um, with it. Yeah, because they you have to also be prepared for somebody saying, oh, I really don't want to talk about that. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have to respect that in that moment. And, um, you know, the subject has been raised. And if they say, no, I don't want to talk about it, then that's, you know, that's something to be respected. Maybe there'll be another yeah. opportunity later on down the road. But the thing, the fact is, is that the more comfortable someone is with it, the more easier it is then to pick up on opportunities when that kind of question or um or suggestion about something. I mean, for example, somebody on one of my courses just recently said that they <clears throat> they wanted to they want they needed their partner to say um, uh, they needed to discuss something with their partner. She was preparing for her own end of life, not that she's ill or anything. She was just doing it because she thought, felt that was important, and so she. Um, she said to him that she needed uh, she needed some help. She needed some help with something. She was trying to work something out and could he help her? Now, it's not very often when you ask for help that people say no, you know, because we are naturally wired, actually, believe it or not, to help other people. So when, it's, when you're asked directly, it's quite difficult to say no. Um, and, and, uh, you know, in this particular case, it could be I need your help with something. It's something you might find it a bit challenging, but actually it's uh, I need help to decide about whether I need to have a burial or whether I need to have a cremation for my own body. So nothing to do with the other person who might be uncomfortable. They just want the sounding board where they talk something through. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, no, no, no. That's, that's great. I was also going to say, too, that um, I, I don't know what... I can't cite any studies off the top of my head, but that um, in terms of grief and finding a way to live with grief or trans, transmute it, I don't think we ever leave it behind. I think we incorporate it, um, that, that people are healthier and happier and less medicated uh, if there's a way that they feel that they can, can uh, share. And, you know, some, some family cultures are such that um, you know, we don't talk about those things and it may even feel like um, going against family traditions if people are doing that. But hopefully, um, you know, those people that might have held back and said, I, I don't want to talk about it right now. If any of us are in proximity with those people enough that we can do some checking in and watching how they're doing down the road, because I think grief takes its toll down the road. For, for all of us, I mean, our losses mount as we age and yeah. they're only going to get more 
as as we say goodbye to other people. I, I see it at my age. And so, you know, how we come through that to be of service to ourselves and to another, I think is very important. Mm. For me, I happen to be a, a talker. So it's easier in some ways for me. Doesn't mean I always know what to say to another, especially if one is not a talker, but that's a great idea. You know, what do you think about open ended questions? Yeah, definitely open ended, definitely open ended. And, you know, it's interesting you built, bring this thing of, you know, more grieving happening because, you know, I had a. I had someone come to see me who was distraught because she just could not go back to work after the death of her dog. Now, she couldn't understand why, even though she had totally loved her dog, she couldn't understand why it was affecting her so much. And actually, what happened in the course of our conversations was that it turned out she had had an unusual amount of deaths in her family from quite a young age, and that the death of the dog, for whatever reason, was bringing all those up again at this particular time. Mm. Um, and with the talking, with you know, this was like um, counselling, so grief counselling. So it was mm. quite a formal session. In that context, she was able to talk about it, and within two months, she had um, been able to process and come through to a point where she. Um, was able to go back to work successfully so yeah that was helpful mm -hmm. you bring yeah. up a you bring up a good point about that I wanted to add I, my stepdaughter went through a very similar situation with the dog is still going through that and many people will dismiss it as like oh come on let's get our priorities straight it wasn't human well for those of us who are animal lovers um, you know we, we know that that's tough but what we discovered as we began to talk a little bit more about that is that there had been so many places in her life where, you know, she felt unsafe, unheard, un anything that, um, and that she poured all of this love and connection into this mm -hmm. dog. Right. And then when this dog left this earth, mm -hmm. that meant to her unconsciously, she's, she's a, you know, she's a PhD, she's a bright woman, but unconsciously everything, that she had loved was once again being taken away and yeah. um, you know if we can see that many of much of what we go through is metaphorical for maybe these losses that have mounted that have been triggered by something that seems to the outside mm -hmm. world yeah less mm -hmm. so. and can and can be a, a blessing and you know if we shift our mind it's a bit of a jump but um, the example of the dog triggering all the past hurt that wasn't healed mm -hmm. and that brought her to you and mm -hmm. she was finally you know she didn't have to take that to the grave she's now released mm -hmm. that and she's walking lighter and she's so so these things I really believe that these these bad things and the losses that we experience are really opportunities in disguise to look deeper yeah. and to feel deeply and and to yeah. release release what we may have been holding yeah, yeah. absolutely um, yeah. There was there was something uh, it's been mentioned a few times just this um, kind of families that don't talk about things and the resistance to talk about certain things and it, it's come up that um, in the preparation you know be, before we die and that the work that you're doing now Jane before I go um, there's talk about a lot of people have journals and personal diaries and, and things that they may not ever want to share Mm -hmm. And then there's also things that, so there's that, if you could touch on that, but there's also this concept of some of us have things we've done in our life that we haven't shared with our closest ones, loved ones. And, and maybe you could speak to that about bringing those little secrets we may have to the grave. And is it best to not share them or to share them or? Yeah. Well, those are hard questions. It's interesting because this is something that people often forget about. They don't even think about it, you know, because if you're living your life, it's you're very close to your own life, you know. So um, to kind of like take a step back and imagine that you're not there, but the evidence of your life in the form of journals or um, uh, whatever else that you may have, around mementos, photographs, I don't know what exactly, but um, that somebody might be looking at those without the full context and without you there to explain why it was important to you. Um, it comes up particularly in the form of secrets. You know, many families have secrets. Many, that means that some family members know something that other family members don't know. Now, 
I don't think it's certainly not my place to say whether it's a good idea to keep a secret or not keep a secret. That's not what I'm about. But I am about asking people to make a conscious decision about it. So it's not something, so that say you uh, have, you are the holder of a secret of some kind, but there is evidence of that in your photograph box or your journals or or your laptop or something like that, then make a decision before you die, hopefully, um, to either get rid of that completely or allow it to be there, but, but either speak about it beforehand or create a context for it, even in a written document or something like that. Because this kind of thing can cause an enormous amount of upset, either people knowing secrets or not knowing, but yet discovering something about the person who's died that hasn't made sense. You know, it can cause quite a lot of distress. And, you know, if you I think can, about uh, this in advance, you know, you know, when you love someone, you don't want to cause them distress. Of course you don't. It's a normal and natural thing. But in order to not do that in this uh, um, realm, i.e. talking about end of life and death and all that sort of stuff, we need to plan in advance. So, um, for example, a friend of mine who, she's died now actually, she just died in the summer, but last year she was part of one of my courses and she made a conscious decision to burn all her journals. She knew there was stuff in there that she didn't want her family to see. It, it, well, it didn't feel appropriate. She thought they didn't need to know it was probably well yeah there was quite a lot of um, bitter words written down that she needed to write down at the time but they're not going to do any good to the uh, the remaining people behind because that was then and this was now so she had a bonfire and she said she felt so good about doing it mm -hmm. and you know journals are a really yeah. personal thing it's like gosh yeah how interesting to imagine yeah. that actually letting go of all that could be a good thing for you right now as well as well as for those afterwards who don't even need to know about it so yeah mm -hmm. what i suggest to people is to make a conscious decision yeah that's great um the the burning of the journals is reminiscent because i i also coach women if they have stuff to come out and it is nasty if you have anger you need to write it out and sometimes that's a really cathartic experience but then what do you do with that so so then i advise to um if you can in your backyard or even if not get a lasagna pan and, and burn it <laughs> and and that that honestly that physical going outside so you're in nature with the flame so you have the earth the air the element of you know fire and there is something incredibly cathartic about that so um yeah so i hear you there well, and, and then the other thing that and I love the metaphor, Misty, just because lasagna, because like you layer all this stuff, so you might yeah. as well layer all this stuff <laughs> and burn the crap out of it. <laughs> Very good, I like that. Great. I never thought of that. Uh, there was something else Jane said that, and and I thought, oh my goodness, um, you know, someone lying on their deathbed, maybe a bit drugged up, maybe not entirely cognizant, but what if that came to mind then? What if you'd mm. lost your ability to? to speak what if you know you're not quite as with it to share what was hard enough to share when you were fully cognizant so uh, i think it's uh, that's such an important part and and it's another one of those things that it's a bit of an elephant in the room we kind of think about it but we don't want to think about it so so we hide and it's a gr great advice just make a decision and yeah yeah, and actually, it's really interesting, you know, because I've got a box of journals. I know that there are some that I want to keep of particular years in my life that are not going to be of anything other than interesting, you know, to people that I might leave behind, say I was to die tomorrow. But actually, there's others there. Oh, I can't imagine that they would want to go through them, but you never know. Uh, so oh, I, 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 I need to... I need to do the lasagna treatment <laughs> with those other ones. <laughs> That's what I'm going to do. So I'm making a commitment here to do that. Um, I'll do that before the end of the year. That's great. great. It, it, yeah. Well, the and you know, lasagna treatment. The, and the hard part about all this um, is that since we never know our how and our when, we don't know when that's going to happen. You know, the very things that we think about um, that would would cause us issues or cause our loved ones issues 
it can happen at any time. So to me, you know, people say, well, then, you know, if I don't know, what's the point? Well, you know, almost kind of like what you teach in your course is, you know, kind of keeping up with these things or taking a look at things. Because maybe some, uh, like, anger stuff that got spewed in a journal from five years ago, which is so not who you are. There's no reason not to take that yearly update that you might look at your will and all that to, like, what can I – what can I? What kind of hot flaming dish lasagna can I serve up now? And look through your, look through your, you know, journals and see what you can burn as you go. Because yeah. to me, that's also energetically moving yeah. the opportunity, the energy out for new things to come in. And uh, I know I'm sitting here looking at a whole box of journals over there that that I, I am swear to God it may be Thanksgiving tomorrow, but I'm having lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> Like that. Oh, that's and oh, I yeah. have a, a dual duffel bag with mine in my shed and, and old tapes too and just different things. And, uh, and I'm thinking, we, I don't know if we could do this, but wouldn't it be fun to have a lasagna party, like, you know, just to <laughs> get it out there and have, get a few women together and, and make an event of it? Wouldn't yeah. that be fabulous? Yeah, that would yeah. be great. Yeah. Layer all that stuff, crisscross <laughs> back and forth. I think that would be fun. We could do that online it's all I can do right now from getting up and leaving this video cast and going over to my drawer and pulling out this stuff seriously I need a seatbelt I need a seatbelt to stay here <laughs> uh, yes. oh my gosh but it's good get it good out stuff. get it out some some way yeah, yeah. so oh my whole point to that was just just to, to finish that up was even though you don't know when it's going to be and it could be tomorrow it, it just makes sense to start you know, planning something today, any little bit. So yeah, and yeah. also, you know, yeah. that, this is about keeping yourself up to date and uh, with your mm -hmm. life. And we've been talking about burning stuff, but you know, it's about keeping yourself up to date with your relationships as well. And because you never know what's going to happen, um, it's a really good idea to uh, make. I mean, that old adage of never go to sleep on a quarrel. You know, it doesn't have to be a quarrel with your the person that you're living with it could be anybody it doesn't matter it's like mm -hmm. actually there's some truth in that my friend um mm -hmm. her ex-husband uh, that she'd been with for 20 years and they'd only been divorced for two he just suddenly dropped dead like two weeks ago and her last conversation mm -hmm. with him she was it was not a good one she was very um uh, bitter and um she's really sad that that happened you know she'd been going to get around to emailing him because she felt differently you know a few days on but she hadn't done it so i really encourage people to keep up to date as well it really works as much as you can yeah mm. yeah jane that's great advice i want to i want to we have about 10 minutes or so left i want to jump into the idea of wills and end of life planning sure. and one of the one of the hesitancies I've heard around creating a will is um, and end of life planning is well why write it all down because it's all going to change anyway you know we, we are agents of change and and what if I write it down and you know so so can you speak to that and sure yeah. well um, yes it's true you may get a will but then it's like well you know when your circumstances change it's going to be out of date so what's the point well actually there is quite a good point in keeping that up to date as well because um, if you do have a will then that will activate on your death regardless of what it says um, so that's an important thing to do to keep if, to be up to date when your circumstances change let's say um, you've been living alone and then you start living with somebody or let's say you get married or let's say you get divorced or you have a baby or something like that, any of the big life events, those are times for you to relook at your will because it might need some changes. Now, it doesn't always need to be a, um, a major change that, incur that incurs costs. It just depends what that is. Um, but there's another reason um, and that is you can tell people, you can have conversations with people, and I really encourage that, but people remember conversations in different ways. It's quite uncanny, actually, how several different people will remember one conversation in, a different, in different ways. So if you want to make sure that there's no quarrels or that the quarrels are minimized, um, 
or that you want what you want to have happen to happen, then it needs to be written down in one mm -hmm. form or another. Mm -hmm. If you want it to be um, legally binding, it needs to be in a will. If you trust the people that, that will be left behind uh, after you've gone, then you can simply write a, a letter uh, of wishes or you can do something like complete my before I go workbook which has all these questions in that you can write down the answers to. Um, it's, it's really easy to underestimate how many difficulties people can get into even with trying to decide where to have a funeral. Um, and to overestimate uh, or to underestimate rather again um, the amount of comfort that is brought when you have um, written down what it is that you want or what well, whatever situation it is that you're in um, and <coughs> the people left behind can actually know that they are making your wishes happen that's very soothing and you don't mm. know that mm. until you've been in that situation of course I've been in that situation I know that but I've heard it from other people as well. So many people saying they would have loved to have given their mom or their dad or their um, friend or cousin or whoever it was the what they wanted, but they didn't know enough to be able to do that. And yet that's yeah. what they wanted. So yeah, yeah get and it I, written down. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in because I uh, the Before I Go workbook, with that, which I've gone through and it was so helpful. And, and there's so many questions in there that you wouldn't, you wouldn't get if you downloaded a will online. There's lots of really great practical stuff, but um, I can feel secure now because not only when um, my predecessor, my daughter, reads this, uh, will she know the basics? But there's little things. So there's space for there's space for some anecdotes in there. There's space to make it a little bit personal, and there's there's. Um, there's that extra bit. It, it's almost like having a conversation after you're gone, and there, it, there is that great comfort. So there's not that questions. What would she have liked? I don't know. She, and so, so it's it's a huge a huge service you can pay to yourself and and to your loved ones. It's it's yeah. quite a gift to leave behind. And and I I wanted to add to that too, since we're singing your praises and your workbook, um, Jane. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, because we both went through this course, and what I find ab about that workbook is, um, we talked about it before, what about, you know, or the concern about what if it changes? Well, mm. rather than even going, let's say somebody's not ready to do a will, or they're just not even on their radar yet, this book can be the thing that, that you change out from time to time. So if there were nothing that you ever did, which, you know, you want to get your wills and your healthcare proxies and all that kind of stuff. But if there's nothing that you ever did and people were trying to figure out your intentions, mm -hmm. you have something right there mm -hmm. that feels less daunting for you, I think, as the person filling it out. Mm -hmm. And it has the, the practical stuff. Like, yeah. as I told you, I, I feel like it's a living document. It, it morphs and changes when you do. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a, a um, scenario where when I first started talking with my husband about things like this. I could get maybe 15 uh, 15 minutes time of his attention before, you know, he had to go or things he had to do. And when we sat down with your workbook, there were a lot, well, I won't go there, but there were a lot of funny things in there that we, <laughs> that we, you know, came together on and spent an hour and a half that looked like it flew by. And I would have never without this workbook and without this guide, would have never been able to spend that much time. So we talked about passwords. We talked about things that were very practical. That if if he died tomorrow, I'm like, where is the where is the water cut off? I I, I have no idea, no idea. <laughs> I'd be standing outside with an umbrella at my feet, the water all over the place, going help. Like on this, that would be it. Yes. Now I know. I still may call somebody, <laughs> but at least I can go. I can go. It's over there. <laughs> well, you know, Patty, I'm really pleased to hear you say that you had a good time with your husband doing that. Yes, because, was... um, that's how this whole thing was born. Because I, before my husband died, it, it, it as it turned out, it was about four months before he died that we had received an email from a friend saying you must get him to answer these questions. And there was a long list of questions, and neither of us really wanted to look at them. But I knew she she followed up. You know, we had at least three <laughs> emails from her saying, "Have you done the questions yet?" 
And eventually I sat down with Philip in the bed on a Saturday morning with the laptop and we went through them together. And it turned out to be an incredibly loving and very um, closely connected thing to do, even though some of the questions were, some of them were very practical, like you said. Some of them were much more difficult when you know you're going to be dying sooner than later. Um, like, you know, what kind of coffin do you want? What uh, how do you want your body to be dressed? Do you have anything that you want to leave to your um, family and friends? You know, things that, are, that you treasure, but that are not of particular value. And, um, but even in that situation where, you know, he um, was, well, uh, we didn't know how many months he had left, but we knew it was months, not years. Um, it turned out to be a really positive and very loving thing for both of us to do for each other. So yeah, I would really encourage that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah, you don't have to get, don't have to get all legal about it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, good point, Patty. And I think it's a beautiful bridge because um, talking about it's one thing, but when you have that something like a talking piece, it's a piece of paper, we've been asked a question, our job is to answer the question. That yeah. sometimes is a lot easier than, well, what do we want to do? Than it being so open ended. So having that that little yeah. workbook there, it's such a, it's a wonderful tool, wonderful tool. And and both of your stories really um, really spoke to that. So um, everyone can stay in touch with Jane, giftedbygrief.com. And and Jane, maybe before we head out, or Patty, if there's anything else we want to say, and Jane, just speak to how people can can stay in touch with you, how they can get your sure. workbook, how they can participate in your course. Okay. Um, well, I um, my website is giftedbygrief.com, and you, if you want to stay in touch with me, I do send out regular inspiring articles about all sorts of things to do with life and death and grief and, and dying, um, and now Ellie the elephant. <laughs> um, if you want to stay in touch, you can just sign up for my mailing list there by um, getting the Before I Go quiz, which is a little introduction into how much you might or might not need to do this workbook. You can also buy the workbook there under the products tab. And um, I do run regular online groups to help people move through the um, the workbook because sometimes it's not so easy on your own. Some people are fine at doing that, but other people like to do it in the company of others. So I uh, will be having one of those coming up in early 2017. So make sure you get on my mailing list if you want to hear about that or connect on Facebook. Um, I wanted to add to what you're saying, not only about the course, but one of the most unexpected things that came out of doing the course. And if you remember, Jane, um, I, I wasn't as much uh, like when we started doing the, the workbook, I was kind of going through some things. But what I recognized is to even get to some of those things, I needed to declutter some things. So I began to declutter my world. Um, so that I could better see what was, you know, what was kind of like, are, are there any things I want to leave? Well, I don't know. There's a whole mess of stuff all over the place. And so I began to go through and, and get a lot clearer on things. So it had the added bonus of helping me declutter, which I think so many of us, you know, experience from one time to another that sure. we feel like we just got to get this heavy thing off us. And sure. um, it was it was so interesting that if you had said to me, oh, you're going to do your uh, end of life, your advanced directives, and that kind of thing, oh, but this whole decluttering process will have to take place. I'd have never put the two together. So there you go. Thank you. That's great to hear. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm such a fan of yours, Jane, for, for not only the work you do, but for the messages you bring, for this way you stand very firmly in what, what you know to be the power of grief um, for it to bring us to some depths to open our hearts to uh, to kind of power us on through to you know stronger and bigger and and better and more available to life so I, I want to thank you so much for being thank with you. us thank you so much that's just great enjoyed it as usual <laughs> good 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 well anything else um, miss you or are we uh, time to sign off 
No, I think we're good. It's been really wonderful as always, Jane. Thank you so much. And we wish you the best of luck in, in forging forward with, uh, with Ellie and, and the Before I Go Solutions. We know you're doing groundbreaking work over there and, um, and it's happening here too. So, so let the, uh, let the depth vibes uh, spread out and, and do their little magic to help people Great. live better. So on that, we'll sign off. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.